The learning goals for this lesson are for you to examine voting situations and possible outcomes, to identify fairness criteria as they pertain to voting methods, and to understand the significance of Arrow's impossibility theorem. First, let's start with the brain activator. Surely, a city employee is given the parking control territory as shown on this map. Please complete the four items here. You will want to use the handout that has this map on it as you work on this problem. Pause the video while you work. Okay, let's do a quick check. Notice that we do have a map and uh, an easy way of drawing all of the edges and the vertices for the map is simply to go down the center of the streets and sort of think of it as the center line. Um, that can be our edges and where those edges come together to form the intersections of the highways um, will be the vertices of the graph. So just quickly let's look at how we can draw this. And this particular um, vertex edge graph is a graph of Shirley's territory. Is the graph connected? Yes, every pair of vertices is connected. If we were to start in the upper left corner, it is possible to find a path that would take us to any of the vertices that are on the graph. The same is true for any vertex that we choose. We could find a path to go to another vertex. You can label these vertices with the valence of the vertices, vertex rather, and as we go around we can see um, what those values are. Does it have an Euler path, an Euler circuit? Well, we know that no, it doesn't have an Euler path and no it's not an Euler circuit and the reason is there are more than two odd vertices so it does not have an Euler path. If it doesn't have an Euler path it can have an Euler circuit because an Euler circuit is a special case of the Euler path. I hope that by doing this brain activator um, I've cleared up some of the difficulty that you might have experienced when you saw maps like this and that um, now when you work on this later on, you'll have a lot easier time with it. We are going to be talking about the mathematics of voting and uh, in this and the following two lessons, we're going to explore different ways that people can vote and that the winner can be determined. Voting theory is the mathematical treatment of the process by which democratic societies or groups resolve the many and conflicting opinions of the members of the group into a single choice of the group. A vote is an expression of a voter's preference about the outcome of an election. Why do we need mathematical theory about something so simple as voting? How difficult could it be to find a simple, fair, and consistent procedure for determining the outcome of an election? Actually, when an election involves only two candidates or alternatives, then the situation is as simple as you might have imagined. For instance, suppose there is an election between Christina and Cody for senior class president. For elections involving only two candidates or alternatives, choosing the candidate or alternative preferred by the majority of voters provides a straightforward, fair, and consistent way of deciding the outcome of the election. I'm sure you've heard the phrase, majority rules. Majority means more than half of the votes. For example, if there are 20 voters, it takes 11 or more votes to make a majority. Half of 20 is 10, and then we've got to have more than that, so the next number more than that would be 11. Generally, we think of that as half 
plus 1, 50 percent plus 1. If there are 35 voters, it takes 18 or more votes to make a majority. That's because when we take half of 35 or 50 percent of 35, we get 17 and a half. Of course, it's silly to think that we'd have 17 and a half votes, but remember that we have to be, have more than half, so we just go to the next whole number. 18 or more votes would be necessary in order to make a majority. The situation is very different, however, when an election involves more than two candidates or alternatives, and we wish to rank each of them in order of preference. Mathematical economist Kenneth Arrow proved in 1952 that there is no consistent method of making a fair choice among three or more candidates with preferential voting. This remarkable result assures us that there is no single preferential election procedure that can always fairly decide the outcome of an election that involves more than two candidates or, or alternatives. What do we mean by fair? Over the years, those who study voting theory have proposed numerous criteria which most people would expect a fair preferential election method to satisfy. In this set of lessons, we will consider four fairness criteria. There are others, but we will only consider these four. The majority criterion, the Condorcet criterion, the monoticity criterion, and the independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion. Please use your note-taking guide as we go through the rest of the video so that you can keep the information that is shared here. First, let's look at the majority criterion. Any candidate receiving a majority of first place votes should be the winner. In other words, it would seem unfair to most people if candidate A got 51 first place votes, candidate B got 40 first place votes, and candidate C got 9 first place votes out of 100 votes in all, but candidate B was declared the winner of the election. Such an outcome would violate the majority criterion. Next, we'll look at the Condorcet criterion. The Condorcet criterion gets its name from the Marquis de Condorcet, an 18th century mathematician, philosopher, and political thinker. Condorcet first pr proposed an election procedure based on the results of head-to-head -head matchups among the candidates. A candidate who wins head-to-head -head matchups with all other candidates should be the winner. Head-to-head -head matchups are those which involve only two candidates. If there are three candidates, a, B, and C, then there are three possible head-to-head -head matchups, A versus B, A versus C, and B versus C. For instance, if there are four candidates, A, B, C, and D, then there are six possible head-to-head -head matchups. We already have the three seen with the three candidate matchup, but as we look at candidate D, we've got to have a head-to-head -head with A and D, B and D, and C and D, giving us a total of six possible head-to-head -head matchups. There is a formula that tells us the total number of head-to-head -head matchups for a given number of candidates. For an election involving N candidates, there are a total of N times N minus 1 divided by 2 head-to-head matchups that are possible. Let's use the formula to find the number of possible head-to-head matchups. We've already looked at the case when we have four candidates and we know that the number of possible head-to-head matchups is six in this case. But we're going to use the formula to verify that. Remember the formula is n times n minus 1 divided by 2, and n in this case is 4. Substituting 4 for n, we get 4 times 4 minus 1 divided by 2. Simplifying, we have 4 times 3 divided by 2, and then doing that multiplication, 12 divided by 2, 
and finally dividing gives us 6. Now suppose that there are 5 candidates instead. Try that and see what you get as the number of possible head-to-head -head matchups. How does your answer compare to these steps? Suppose that the candidates are A, B, C, D, and E. Can you name all of the ten of the head-to-head -head matchups? A candidate who wins head-to-head -head matchups with all other candidates should be the winner. Suppose four candidates A, B, C, and D run for mayor of a small town, a very small town. There are 20 registered voters. The local newspaper performed a post-election survey of 20 registered voters. Among other things, the survey asked the voters who they preferred in a two-way race between candidate C, the one who was endorsed by the paper's editorial staff, and each of the other candidates. Here are the results. 11 voters preferred candidate C over candidate A. 11 voters preferred candidate C over candidate B. 17 voters preferred candidate C over candidate D. So in head-to-head -head competition, candidate C won against each of the other candidates. Wouldn't it seem unfair if candidate C was not declared the winner? When the actual votes were tabulated, candidate A got nine first place votes, candidate B got no first place votes, candidate C got eight first place votes, and candidate D got three first place votes. If candidate C, though, is not declared the winner, this would be a violation of the Condorcet criterion. Next, we'll look at the monotonicity criterion. If a candidate wins an election and then we change some of the ballots, but only so as to increase the ratings on those ballots of the winning candidate, then that candidate should still win. Think about that. You're probably thinking, duh. Of course, if a candidate wins the election and then we change some of the ballots, but we only do it so that we increase the ratings for the winning candidate, then that candidate should still win. It sounds obvious, but let's look to see what happens in elections. Three students, Penny, Blue, and Rusty, are running for class president. The class will vote in rounds. The student with the fewest votes in the first round will drop out and a new vote will be taken between the two remaining candidates. The student with the most votes in this final round will be declared the winner of the election. In the first round, Penny gets 11 votes, Blue gets 8 votes, and Rusty gets 10 votes. Blue drops out since he had the fewest votes in the first round. In the final round, Penny gets 11 first place votes and Rusty gets 18 first place votes. Rusty wins the election. But wait! The chairman of the election oversight committee destroyed the ballots before the results had been officially certified by the administration. You guessed it! The election had to be repeated. In the first round of the repeated election, everyone voted exactly as in the first round of the original election, except for four voters who decided to jump on the bandwagon and vote for Rusty instead of Penny. As a result, Penny gets seven first place votes, Blue gets eight first place votes, and Rusty gets 14 first place votes. This causes Penny to drop out instead of Blue so that the final round of the repeated election is between Blue and Rusty. But the seven students who originally voted for Penny prefer Blue over Rusty. So all seven of them cast their votes for Blue in the final round. This gives Blue 15 votes and Rusty 14 votes. Blue wins the repeated election even though the only changes in voter preference were the four votes that changed from Penny to Rusty, the original winner. 
This illustrates a violation of the monotonicity criterion. The independence of irrelevant alternatives criterion is the fourth one that we're considering. If an election is held and a winner is declared, this winning candidate should remain the winner in any recalculation of votes as a result of one or more of the losing candidates dropping out. Let's take an example. As a publicity stunt for its soon to be published cookbook, the Culinary Club of Smallville decided to have a best pie contest. The entries were narrowed down to three for the final round of the contest. In this final round, each club member ranked the three pies. Each first place vote is worth three points, each second place vote is worth two points, and each third place vote is worth one point. Here's a summary of the results. 27 members ranked Al's apple pie first, Chris's cream pie second, and Pat's pecan pie third. 24 members ranked Pat's pecan pie first, Chris's cream pie second, and Al's apple pie third. Two members ranked Chris's cream pie first, Pat's peach pie second, and Al's apple pie third. Based on the rules given, Al's apple pie got 27 first place votes at three points each for 81 points and 26 third place votes at one point each for 26 points. That gave Al a grand total of 107 points. Chris's cream pie got two first place votes at three points each for six points and 51 second place votes at two points each for 102 points for a grand total of 108 points. Pat's Pecan Pie got 24 first place votes at three points each for 72 points, two second place votes at two points each for four points, and 27 third place votes at one point each for 27 points for a grand total of 103 points. Therefore, Chris's Cream Pie gets first place with 108 points, Al comes in second for his apple pie, and Pat is third with 103 points for the pecan pie. Before the results can be publicized, Pat, who is upset about a third place finish, demands that her pecan pie entry be retroactively withdrawn from the contest. Bowing to um, her wishes, the club removes Pat's pecan pie and recalculates points. Two points for each first place and one point for each second place. Since Pat's pecan pie is now out, the vote's results are Al's apple pie gets 27 first place votes at two points each for 54 points. 26 second place votes at one point each for 26 points for a grand total of 80 points. Chris's cream pie gets 26 first place votes at two points each for 52 points and 27 second place votes at one point each for 27 points, giving Chris a grand total of 79 points. This time, Al's apple pie gets first place with 80 points, and Chris's cream pie gets second place with 79 points. Notice what happened. Because a loser, Pat, dropped out, the winner changed from Chris to Al. This is a violation of the independence of the irrelevant alternatives criterion. Voting is simple, right? Everyone just votes for their favorite and the votes are counted. The person or the alternative with the most votes wins. But is that always the best way? Suppose a family decides to vote on a place to visit on vacation. Dad loves the mountains but hates the beach, too sandy. He would enjoy Disney World but not as much as the mountains. He's voting for the mountains. Mom loves the beach but hates the mountains, too many steep trails to climb. 
She would enjoy Disney World, but not as much as the beach. The beach gets her vote. Alice loves the beach, but hates the mountains, just like Mom. She would also enjoy Disney World, but not as much as the beach. Her vote is the beach. Tommy loves Disney World more than anything else. He can't stand the mountains, boring, and the beach, too hot. His vote is for Disney. If everyone votes for their favorite, the beach will get two votes, Mom and Alice. The mountains will get one vote, Dad. And Disney World will get one vote, Tommy. So the beach wins. Is the beach really the best choice for the family vacation? Think about it. Half of the family members, Dad and Tommy, hate the beach. Should the family really go to a spot that half of the family hates? Is there a better choice? Look back at the preferences of each family member and think about a suggestion for a better vacation spot. Is the most first place votes wins method really the best method here? For many years, mathematicians and others interested in voting theory searched for a preferential voting procedure that would satisfy a reasonable set of fairness criteria, which we've discussed. In 1952, Kenneth Arrow's work showed that it's mathematically impossible for a democratic voting method to satisfy all the fairness criteria. There is no perfect preferential voting procedure. The decision about the procedure to be used is subjective. The best we can do is objectively analyze the strengths and weaknesses of various preferential procedures in order to pick a good method for a particular situation. The family vacation example suggests that perhaps there should be different voting methods in different situations. For instance, in that example, maybe the family should consider a voting method that takes into consideration what each family member likes and dislikes. Counting first place votes takes care of the likes, but completely ignores the dislikes. In the next two lessons, we'll consider five different voting methods, although there are many more. These voting methods are divided among preferential voting and non-preferential voting. The four types of preferential voting methods we'll examine are the plurality, plurality with elimination, the board account method, and pairwise comparisons. The type of non-preferential voting we'll examine is approval voting. We will look at how these five different voting methods work and examine the strengths and weaknesses of each. In particular, we will look at each preferential voting method in light of the four fairness criteria. Remember, from Kenneth's era's work, we know that no preferential voting method can satisfy all fairness criteria. In this lesson, you have learned to examine voting situations and possible outcomes, to identify fairness criteria as they pertain to voting methods, and to understand the significance of Arrow's impossibility theorem.